my privilege to um, first of all introduce uh, Ulf, um, Ulf Ottersen, who's um, in, um, sitting in Sweden. Um, there, are, there are various uh, diseases that uh, biologists get. So if you do your, um, your PhD on, say, uh, albatrosses, you, uh, you have this disease called albatross, and you're never happy again in your life if you're uh, not doing research on albatrosses. So there's also uh, diseases called um, um, whales, diseases called sharks, and another one is, um, is elephants. Um, and there are also uh, places that um, have have diseases. So I made uh, two trips to the uh, to the tundra, and um, ever since then I've sort of um, when it gets to uh, May June, I get twitchy about the fact that um, I'm not going back to the um, to the Siberian tundra. So that's a it's a very funny uh, funny feeling, and um, and and oof is uh, the sufferer of a disease called. Uh, Africa. If you, uh, it's a very Africa is a very dangerous place to visit, and uh, it's not dangerous for the uh, for the obvious reasons that uh, most people think of. It's dangerous because once Africa gets into your blood, it's uh, very hard to get Africa out of your blood. And various people do various things to uh, cope with it. Uh, many people end up uh, making themselves poor because they work all year to spend a, a month or so in Africa um, and that's how they do it. But uh, Ulf has, uh, has taken a different route and so Ulf, it's uh, over to you to tell us about Ulf in Africa. Thanks Ulf. Thanks Les. Uh, I also suffer from that tundra disease as you know. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a bit uh, strange but uh, as much as the African heat uh, gives me goosebumps, I also love to see ice a lot. Well, I try to share my screen here. If that's okay. Yes. Thanks, Wolf. So, um, well, it, Les have been asking me for some time uh, about uh, giving a talk here and uh, I was a bit stressed one uh, evening when he was uh, chasing me more than usual. So I have come up with this short title, uh, talking a little bit about my uh, African life. But it's also a little bit about Aplori. Uh, Nigerian bird atlas. Very little about Nigerian bird atlas because other people have talked about that before or we can come back to that again as another theme. So why Africa? Well, once upon a time uh, I was young and worked at Utenby Bird Observatory in southeastern Sweden and sitting there and ringing a lot of birds and release them they go, you know, some of them, not these long tailed teeth, they won't reach Africa, but some other birds will reach Africa. And in our dreams, we wanted to follow them. And uh, Sweden is here, and Utenby is down here in the southeast of Sweden on the island of Erland. So we, and we had passed that stage, the Swedish thought that swallows and birds were uh, incubating, not incubating, were um, dormant in water. This is a famous painting from uh, Alaus Magnus in the 16th century, drawing swallows from the bottom of a lake in winter. But we were ringing and we know that birds from Sweden especially like swallows were going to Africa. So we wanted to follow our birds and uh, mainly willow warblers and different kinds of reed warblers was our target. But do you know actually what the first proofs that birds come from winters in Africa was this strange uh, spear storks. There's actually 15 of them in different parts of Europe coming back with African spears in their neck 
proving that they were in Africa. So this was in the mid 19th centuries. And the first hard fact um, that birds visited Africa when the, during the time that wasn't in Europe. We had also read Moreau, so we knew that the area to target was the Sahel. In this picture, the deeper red, the more higher diversity of Paleoarctic migrants. So it's a drier savannas of West Africa that we were wanted to go to. And in, on our, in our old school maps, there was a blue patch in this area, Lake Chad in northeastern Nigeria. So Jang and Naive said, we go to Lake Chad. But as you know, these days, Lake Chad is not anymore. And uh, it was hard when we were there in 2000, it was a bit more than now, but not as much in 1972. However, we wrote around to people working in Nigeria and other places in West Africa, and they consider us uh, mad if we wanted to go to, to Lake Chad in Nigeria. So we instead we were advised to go to Ghana by one of our lecturers who had been there in the 60s as a professor. So we went to Ghana first time in 1985 to the northern part of Ghana where we trapped for example uh, great weed warblers and we saw that when we arrived in October we arrived at the same time as the great weed warbler. After a while, the great weed warblers put on fat, started to sing, and then they disappeared and they molted and then they disappeared. So before December ending, they have disappeared from this area in northern Ghana and there was no more. A little bit later, we come across a data set from southern Ghana where a lady was ringing in a pond in her garden. And so this area, this area, the great weed warbler arrived a little bit later and some stayed through the winter, but there was a peak in migration and then uh, some stayed and it leveled off. So what we could show here was that it has an itinerary way of migration in West Africa for at least the great weed warbler. We also later showed it for the garden warbler who arrived, stays a bit and then go further. And this was new for West Africa. It was new before for people studying birds in Savo uh, in, in Kenya. But we were a bit stubborn so in 1999 and 2000, they managed to come to Lake Chad. And uh, we ring there for, we had an expedition there for totally seven months and ring three, four thousand uh, Paleoarctic migrants and saw a lot of other birds. So eventually we, we come there. The water here is not actually Lake Chad, it's more like the river that flew into your, uh, that it, the river Yobe that is the border between uh, Nigeria and Niger. And after rainy season, there comes some water and fills up some parts of the northern lake, but it's not really the lake itself. So why the interest in migrants in Africa? Yes, because we know that a lot of many species of our migrants that spend the non-breeding season in Africa, they are on decline compared to more resident European species, even if they're not doing extremely good, they don't have a, that big decline as trans-Saharan migrants have. And the thing is that, and we have, a, we have this one, turtle dove is also one example of an extreme catastrophe that will continue. So the decline is now actually more than 90%. So why do they decline more, the Paleoarctic migrants compared to European migrants? Where is the problem? What drives the decline? This is 
questions we need to try to answer by studying Paleoarctic migrants, not only in African winter grounds, but also in the stopover grounds. Because we know that some effects of situation in Africa carries o carry overs and into Europe. So here is an diagram showing the rainfall index in Sahel on the x-axis and the annual survival of sedge warbler trapped in England. So the more rain in Sahel, the more birds come back or vice versa. The less rain, the less birds come back to England. For storks, again, we have the Sahel rain index on the x-axis and breeding success on the y-axis. And the more rain in Sahel, the higher breeding success in, for the white stork. These are these carryover effects that is important to know and see that the situation in Africa have an influence of the situation for, for the birds breeding in Europe. And in the Sahel, is actually under high pressure from humans and their, their cattle and sheep. And in these areas, like in northern Nigeria, that is where you have also very high increase of population. In a few years, the mean density of trees in Sahel have gone from like 400 trees per hectare to less than 50 trees per hectare. And this is pictures we, I took in the year 2000 and we traveled through this area during two, three years time. And you could see by yourself uh, how much trees have been chopped down, chopped down as food or as here for the goats and for, for cows. And this place is actually an, uh, a reserve because this signboard here this signboard here is showing a uh, forest reserve, but it's, it fell down. So the, the forest is gone, the bushes is gone to firewood and for feeding for animals. And we know that from our studies that when tree density goes down, bird density, when tree density when tree density goes up, the bird density goes up. So when tree density goes down, the bird density goes down. And here's data from Northern Nigeria subalpine warblers. And if you look into the NDVI from a dry season in, in Africa, and here the, the right-hand uh, map show how vegetation change over time. And the more red, the more vegetation uh, disappear. Of course, there's a lot of forest going away in the big forest area, like in the Congo Basin. But there is a red belt in Sahel, where a lot of forest have been cut down or transferred to farmland. And this is what often is referred to as uh, desertification. But it's all absolutely clear that it's most likely because of human uh, interference, an atopianic effect. So red is habitat loss. And the more red, the more habitat is lost. And where we have a lot of habitat loss is also where we have uh, wintering grounds of the birds that we are interested in. So we can see here that land use in the Sahel, farming have increased heavily during the last 50 years. And that will of course result in increased crops, more cereals, and more people also in make it the number of sheep and goats increase a lot in this area. 
and this is what what um, influence what we see in these areas. So now to a glory. When I was in Lake Chad, I first time I met Mr. Phil Hall and Mr. Leventis. And Mr. Leventis started 2001. He wanted to start a glory and started to build it. And at that time they asked me to come as a lecturer. So a glory is a institute for ornithology in West Africa, where the main course is uh, conservation biology. But we also work a lot with uh, people around and some other projects. Aplor is situated in Jos, almost central Nigeria, a little bit north of center, in about four hours, five hours drive from Abuja. And it's a plateau on mean elevation is about 13 to 1400 meters, so it's relatively cool compared to other places in Nigeria. And here we have an institute in the middle of a bush where now the students live in this house and I walk down to lectures and offices down here. So the aim of the institute is the education, the conservation biology, to do research, to do conservation, and also uh, develop the community. We have a European standard master's program in conservation biology, where we now have uh, teach more than 100 MST students. And some of them go further into other places to become uh, PhD students, like in Cape Town and Sweden. Around in is our institute, we have a small forest reserve where we've seen more than 300 bird species and ringed almost 30,000 birds now. The habitat there is a mix between grassland, uh, rocky hills, rocky outcrops and gallery forest. And it's also the type locality for two other the endemic or almost endemic birds in Nigeria, the rock firefinch and its breeding nest parasite, the plateau indigo bird. So a lot, quite a lot of our teaching is just out, step out from the door and we go out in the bush. So we have seasonal changes in Africa like we have in Europe. And one big surprise for me after working in, in Africa was to see how movable even uh, tropical birds are. It's more rule than not that birds move and migrate a bit. So one study we did was on African cuckoo, which is very similar to the European cuckoo. And European cuckoo you can have a satellite transmitter of five grams. We did it for some years, now we have to gone down a bit, but you can use normal, small satellite transmitters on this. And European cuckoos, we know, travel into Africa. They stay for one month in August around the Sahel before they go down to the Congo Basin and then go back. Recently, we also found out, or people found out that some Chinese cuckoos move into Africa, which wasn't known before. So, by this in mind, we wanted to see what, where, where the African cuckoo will go. Because as you know, most cuckoos, or all cuckoos in, in Africa, or in West Africa, they travel, migrate with the rain. So during the rainy season in Jos, we have like six, seven species whereas during a dry season, we don't have anyone. So the African cuckoo comes to Jos, to our area in March, April, and leaves by August, September. 
So we put satellite transmitters on five birds and three of them survived for several years and they move into Cameroon or even into uh, Central African Republic. And then, so this is a good example of movement of African bird. And then recently, about well, five years ago, uh, we ventured into Nigerian bird atlas, which was a success story with our bird clubs and we have now covered 25% of Nigeria, the pentads in Nigeria. And with the inspiration of that and talking with Les and Colin in Kenya, we then introduced the African bird atlas, which is now uh, in its infancy, but we are still working on it and trying to uh, make it a real project. But we have had uh, workshops in Sierra Leone and Liberia. We have had an uh, online workshop for Ghana and last week we had one for Cameroon. And I hope soon we should have for Ethiopia, Gambia, maybe Uganda and Rwanda. So we have to try to diversify it uh, into more countries in Africa outside the, the core areas of Southern Africa, Kenya and Nigeria. And we're also working on getting it. Bird Lasso is already have a French bird list, but the interface is still in, in English. So I hope that we relatively soon could get it with a French interface so we can go into the francophone countries. Any questions for um, for Ulf? That was fascinating. Okay, so I'm getting messages here. Um, are there questions for uh, for Ulf that anybody wants to um, wants to put to him?